Good morning. I'm uh, Blaine Moores. I'm a uh, associate professor of uh, biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City. And um, I'm going to be talking about uh, comparing protein structures with closure. I have been involved in the side-close uh, community uh, via um, the joint prob uh, study group. So we've been working our way through uh, several textbooks on Bayesian data analysis. And in the process of doing so, um, the opportunity came up to apply a little bit of what we're learning, working with uh, PIMC uh, to um, a problem in uh, protein uh, bioinformatics, the problem of uh, overlaying protein structures to compare them. This uh, is the principal method that we use to test our hypotheses about protein structure. So I'm going to provide a very gentle and basic introduction to protein structure to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I will uh, talk about, uh, I'll demonstrate the comparison of uh, two protein structures. One predicted via uh, artificial intelligence, via AlphaFold2, and the other one from experiment, uh, uh, from experiment done uh, in my lab. And then I will introduce uh, probabilistic programming and um, it, the use of probabilistic programming to overlay uh, protein structures. And we used a published uh, example to um, uh, uh, adapt it. We adapted a published example to um, uh, use in closure. And uh, uh, we were able to succeed in doing so thanks to the uh, libpython-clj uh, uh, package. So proteins are uh, poly polymers of amino acids, of 20 different amino acids. And uh, this is a cartoon, very simple cartoon that represents an unfolded protein on the left and thermodynamic equilibrium with a folded protein on the right. And uh, the uh, shape that's adopted by the folded pro uh, protein is determined by the amino acid sequence. These uh, 20 amino acids differ in um, the shape and size of, and biophysical properties of their side chains. So um, these little knobs along this white tube that represents the polypeptide chain are uh, models of uh, amino acids. And uh, they're colored in uh, two colors, blue for the polar amino acids and green for the non-polar amino acids. So the non-polar amino acids, um, they're often called hydrophobic, but uh, water-fearing. Uh, the reality is they actually just prefer to interact with each other, and uh, they tend to be found in the interiors of proteins, whereas the polar residues are found on the outside. What's pretty amazing is that many different uh, variants on a protein sequence can fold up into the essentially the same structure. So through evolution, the same protein in many different species will have a, um, evolved different amino acid sequences, but still have the same uh, protein structure. So the mystery is um, if we could uh, you know, understand how a given sequence will fold up into a particular structure, then we would solve the pro uh, protein folding problem. This is another uh, representation of protein structure. This is a ribbon diagram. Um, in this structure, we are not showing all atoms. We're just showing uh, the backbone and uh, that backbone has some regions that form these uh, nice coiled ribbons, or represented by nice coiled ribbons that are forming alpha helices. And then we have these uh, flattened arrows that represent the beta strands that make up beta sheets. So the alpha helices and the beta strands will form early in the protein folding process, and then um, they will collapse upon each other to give the final folded structure. This kind of uh, representation of the protein structure through this ribbon diagram, which is um, representing a protein that has 3,000 atoms, it was uh, um, developed by Jane Richardson around 1980. Uh, she is still active as a professor at, in this town at Duke University. This uh, structure was determined in my lab by x-ray crystallography. We, um, the role of this structure is uh, um, to, we all have this protein, 
in our cells and uh, hopefully it's inactive in all of us because when it becomes active, uh, this can trigger the development of tumors. Uh, uh, in, and uh, right now this uh, drug has been developed to uh, treat uh, patients who suffer from non-small cell uh, lung cancer. So this, um, the overall shape of the protein determines its function. The function of this protein is to uh, bind ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and remove a phosphate group and transfer it to a tyrosine, on a specific tyrosine on another uh, protein, and that starts a chain of um, that a single that's passed on through to other proteins that triggers rapid cell growth and the development of tumors. So our goal was to find uh, uh, drug compounds that can displace the ATP and, uh, and keep this uh, protein inactive. This figure shows an uh, outline of our, the workflow in our lab. So in the upper left, we have a, a picture of a crystal. So the weakness of protein crystallography is you have to conjole 100 billion proteins to line up in an ordered arrays to form crystals. And uh, so this crystal is uh, puny. It's only like six-tenths of a millimeter in the longest dimension, uh, one-tenth of a millimeter in the, in the narrow dimension. We'll scoop up the crystal in a little tiny nylon loop underneath a binocular microscope, and then uh, place it underneath the vertical tube in the central figure. Um, so this uh, vertical tube has a, a stream of uh, uh, nitrogen coming out at 100 degrees Kelvin. The temperature of this room is probably about uh, 295 degrees Kelvin in comparison. Um, and uh, this, uh, by, if we place the crystal in the cold stream quickly enough, it, it's uh, flash cooled into a glassy state. And then when it's in that glassy state, it can withstand uh, being exposed to x-rays uh, with our instrument for up to a day. And, uh, um, and you'll see the, the importance of this in a minute. Um, we then rotate the crystal, and as we rotate it, certain subsets of atoms in the crystal will uh, scatter x-rays in a constructive fashion that gives diffraction spots. We'll rotate the crystal uh, one degree while taking an uh, uh, image, uh, which is shown in the upper right, and uh, that image has about 2,000 diffraction spots on it. To be able to attain all the possible diffraction spots, we have to continue rotating the crystal 180 degrees. We wind up with about a quarter to a half million diffraction spots that we then, um, uh, uh, we wind up integrating uh, the intensities uh, for each spot and, and then uh, do uh, merging of uh, symmetry-related spots. We then combine that information with uh, phase information from other experiments to generate the electron density map that's represented by this chicken wire. Um, so the chicken wire represents the one sigma contour level above the uh, mean electron density value in the crystal. And this uh, image is centered on the uh, drug molecule colored uh, with uh, cyan. Then in the, uh, so that gives us one structure, but one structure by itself uh, often isn't sufficient to test hypotheses. So in the lower, uh, uh, right, we have a superposition of two structures, uh, one with uh, our uh, cyan-colored drug, and the second structure has a white-colored drug, which is the uh, drug that's used initially to treat patients that have a mutation that triggers this uh, kinase to become active. The problem is the white drug will, um, after a, a patient's been treated with white drug for a year to two years, they will develop mutations that block the binding by that drug. And then their tumors reemerge and, and uh, they're in trouble again. So we have, um, in, in this case, at uh, uh, site 810, normally there's a glycine. Glycines do not have a side chain. But uh, uh, a mutation can occur that leads to an alanine. An alanine introduces a methyl group that blocks the binding by the white drug. So uh, our cyan-colored drug, however, the new second-generation drug, is able to bind in the presence of the alanine. 
So by uh, doing this uh, comparison, we're able to understand uh, why our uh, new drug is, is effective when this uh, mutation occurs. So this is a game of whack-a-mole, more or less, uh, but uh, we're being paid to do this by the NI NIH. Um, so already new uh, mutations have appeared that block the binding by the cyan drug. And so we are trying to find new drugs that can uh, bind uh, to these, uh, in the presence of these uh, new mutated sites. So um, we uh, do our initial work in the lab. Um, our in-house source uh, is very valuable for working out the cryo conditions and, and uh, initially just determining whether or not the crystals diffract. And then uh, we will ship these crystals to a remote location at one of these five uh, national facilities where uh, electrons are being moved in a large circle up to uh, almost half mile in diameter. Um, that, uh, and while they're being moved in this circle, they give off radiation. And that radiation includes uh, a spectrum of x-rays. And we can select out specific uh, x-rays of specific wavelengths. And, and these uh, x-rays are 10,000 times more intense than the x-rays that we can generate in our lab. So we can collect a data set at one of these facilities in uh, several minutes whereas uh, in-house it takes us about a full day. And so we can do in a couple days work at one of these facilities, a year's worth of work uh, done in our lab. And the data that we obtain will be of a higher quality. So because of development of cryo methods and access to these facilities that came about in the late 1990s, there's been an explosion in uh, protein structures. Um, so these, uh, there are now about 200,000 structures in the protein data bank. This is a uh, public resource that was set up 50 years ago uh, by uh, some people with uh, great foresight. And uh, um, throughout the whole entire time, they've been practicing the principles of FAIR, which are uh, deeply ingrained in our community. This is the workflow for uh, AlphaFold. Um, and uh, so AlphaFold, um, uh, you start out with a uh, the amino acid sequence of the protein of interest that you want to fold up. And uh, that's shown on the left. And, and then uh, you have all these intermediate states. And then the output is a folded uh, model of a protein structure. The blue areas in this uh, model are uh, 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 colored by uh, confidence. So the, um, they have, the ones that are blue have high confidence. The ones that have uh, regions that are of low confidence are colored orange. So the regions of low confidence are ones that are, are probably underrepresented in the sequence uh, database or in the structure database. This is a comparison of a, a protein that uh, comes from a bacteria that's found in, uh, associated with the urinary tract infections. And uh, the AlphaFold uh, model is shown in dark blue, and it's been overlaid, superimposed, or superposed on the uh, experimental structure in green. And uh, you can see there's a very good agreement. The root mean square deviation, this is a common metric of evaluating uh, how similar two structures are. So this, we're comparing the distance uh, between paired atoms between the two structures, and it's uh, 0.8 angstroms. The experimental accuracy of this uh, crystal structure is probably somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2 angstroms. So the difference is on the same order of magnitude as the experimental accuracy of the structure. Now to return to the rec kinase that we determined in my lab, uh, it's shown in green on the left. And then on uh, the right, we have um, the structure from alpha fold. You can see they're not superimposed. You don't, they don't, when you download the structure on the left, it's uh, positioned in the unit cell where, um, uh, um, where it's found in electron density. It's not centered at the origin of uh, Cartesian space. So our problem is we have to move the structure on the right onto the one, to the one uh, on the left. The one on the right has to be flipped over, has to be rotated around the x-axis, and then we have to uh, translate it. So I use the convention, oops, um, 
I, I uh, need to back up a second. I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, um, there are not big open spaces in protein structures as suggested by the ribbon diagrams. You can be an undergraduate in biology and see nothing but ribbon diagrams for four years and forget that actually proteins are full of packed atoms. So this is a van der Waals representation of the 3,000 atoms in the protein. Uh, these spheres are centered on the, uh, each atom and they're uh, scaled according to the van der Waals radius of the atoms. And this is another uh, representation uh, in which we have just, we're just showing uh, sticks linking together uh, pairs of atoms. These represent the bonds between atoms. We're going to focus in on the lower left-hand corner, the C terminus of our rec kinase domain. And I'm going to throw at you yet another uh, rec uh, molecular representation called a C alpha trace. These are often used when comparing overlays of structures. And we're going to be looking at C alpha traces uh, throughout the rest of this talk. So we're looking at the C terminus. Um, the, it's this arginine uh, uh, 1013. So the numbering of the residues starts with a one at the end terminus and then it pro uh, progresses um, th th along the chain. Um, we have uh, drawn virtual bonds between the C alpha carbon atoms, which are represented by small spheres. The C alpha carbon atom is part of the backbone. It has, uh, it's the atom to which the side chain is attached. So with the C alpha carbon atoms, you can you know, make out uh, alpha helices after you become familiar with these kind of diagrams. You can see uh, coils of the C alpha trace that uh, represent those alpha helices, uh, such as uh, in this area and this area. So I'm going to use, uh, I'm using the conventional approach to superimposing the two structures. This conventional approach assumes that all the atoms in the polypeptide chain have the same uh, variance in their position. This is obviously a false assumption. Um, so, uh, but this, it works, it's fast. And I used a um, molecular graphics program called PyMol. Uh, so this is, uh, um, this program was, it's been around for uh, 22 years. It was developed by Warren Delano. He, was, he had the foresight to see that Python could have a role in scientific computing uh, before many others did. And uh, he wrapped uh, Python around uh, a series of C programs that do the actual molecular graphics to enable easier interaction with the, uh, 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 his program. And he also wrote a domain-specific language, which I'm using here. I've issued a command that aligns the two structures uh, using their amino acid sequence to match up uh, like residues. And then um, it goes through a series of uh, fitting steps. Uh, there's uh, five cycles, and those uh, atoms that are long, are, have a long distance separating them are rejected from the fitting process to avoid uh, biasing, biasing it too much. So we wind up with a fit that used uh, 235 atom pairs and we have a root mean square deviation of a half an angstrom. So here's our fit and, and uh, shows uh, why the sequence alignment step was necessary because we have a loop in our alpha fold model that's colored magenta on the left side and this loop was absent from the crystal structure because that loop is moving too much. It's moving more than probably an angstrom and as a result, the electron density associated with it is too blurry and uh, we, we can't uh, visualize it. There's also a couple other discrepancies. Um, there's one by the drug binding site in this area that I'm going to focus in on. And uh, you can see that our alpha fold 2 model has a C alpha chain passing through part of the drug. Uh, the left part of the drug was able to bind to the ATP binding site, but the right side of the drug actually pried open a cavity that did not exist before the drug bound. So if we had tried to use the alpha fold model for drug design, we would have uh, never discovered uh, uh, the possibility of this drug uh, binding to this protein. So uh, we still have to do experiments. 
So this problem of superimposing crystal structures uh, has been around for a long time. And uh, these are just some of the key papers. This is not a solved problem. Uh, coming up with the optimal superposition is still um, has room uh, for improvement. And um, so the method I used was by the uh, second paper listed by Wolfgang Kabisch. And then um, Douglas Theobald has uh, been leading the way in terms of applying a approach in which you do not assume that every position along polypeptide chain has equal variance. Um, and uh, his approach is called uh, Theseus, he, um, and his program has been available for the past decade. Um, like several years ago, a group in Denmark developed a probabilistic programming approach to this problem. And they um, used uh, the program uh, Pyro, uh, and uh, so <clears throat> what is a probabilistic programming language? So this is a um, domain-specific language in which you can describe a statistical model without having to worry about uh, also describing the details of the inference machinery. Um, so this allows you to be uh, more productive in your uh, statistical modeling and allows you to more easily develop uh, more uh, sophisticated models. So they call this approach uh, Theseus PP or Theseus map, as we'll uh, see later. So the um, map is a, a single value that's returned by this process. You can think of it as uh, uh, the peak in the uh, posterior distribution from Bayesian statistics. So it's similar to the prior maximum likelihood method that returns a single point value. So this is a, a graphical model that they used. Um, so these arrows uh, point to uh, or link uh, variables that uh, uh, influence our, our data. Our data are represented by x1. x1 is the structure that's going to be held fixed. x2 is the structure that we're going to move. Oops. And uh, x1 and x2 are thought to be noisy snapshots of the same thing, of the mean structure that's represented by m. And we're, um, in this model, we're going to assume that uh, x1 and x2 share the same variance at the same position in the polypeptide chain. But this is a um, u is a, um, a vector, the values of which vary along the polypeptide chain. Then uh, t is a translation that we use to move x2 to x1. And r is the rotation matrix that's applied to, to x2 to line it up with x1. So this is some statistical modeling pseudocode that describes the statistical relationships uh, for each of these variables. And uh, that, that's all you need to know about that. Um, <laughs> it shows the application of this probabilistic programming approach. Um, so in the upper left, we have the uh, approach by Kabish. Uh, what you're looking at are two confirmations, two uh, structures from a NMR structure determination of a protein. The uh, PDB code is on the right. And in uh, this method um, which, uh, of nuclear magnetic resonance, you determine the distances between pairs of atoms up to about five angstroms. The weakness of this method is that you do not have long distance information. Uh, so it's hard to constrain the overall shape. But uh, um, the ends of this protein are very mobile, and, uh, but the core part of it is, uh, appears to be quite stable. So we're looking at uh, two models that are consistent with this NMR data. NMR, this NMR technique is of uh, less accuracy than uh, protein crystallography. On the right, we have, upper right, we have the superposition by this Theseus uh, PP method, and uh, you can see there's a vast improvement in the fit. And then in the graph at the bottom, we have uh, the, the orange line represents uh, the distance between pairs of atoms, and you can see it's uh, much lower in the central region compared to the conventional method uh, represented in blue. So they uh, then, um, there's sort of a weakness of this appro uh, approach I just showed you, 
and that you have to use the conventional method first before you can use the Theseus PP approach. And uh, uh, because it has a small radius of convergence. So um, this uh, group uh, obtained access to NumPyro. Uh, it, uh, and uh, NumPyro uses uh, JAX to do its uh, tensor math. And uh, this enabled the application of Monte Carlo, excuse me, Hamilton Monte Carlo, which is much more efficient than uh, the uh, prior um, random walk uh, sampling approaches. Um, so they call this uh, new technique Theseus-HMC. So this, um, just to demonstrate the power of, H of uh, HMC compared to the uh, prior sampling methods, um, we have plotted here, shown here is uh, a uh, probability distribution or a sampling of, of a parameter space. We have just two parameters and the uh, probability distribution is steeply peaked. And as such, in these kind of situations, uh, random walk does quite poorly. So uh, each of these three graphs have the same number of blue dots, the same number of steps were taken. And you can see uh, on the left, hardly any um, a very small part of the parameter space was sampled. In the center, more of the space was sampled. And on the right, much more space was sampled. So on the left, uh, MH represents um, Metropolis Hastings uh, algorithm, it, which was uh, um, uh, developed in uh, 1972. Um, and then in the middle is the uh, Gibbs uh, sampler, which is an, obviously an improvement on the uh, Metropolis Hastings uh, algorithm. So when they applied uh, this uh, approach, they um, uh, uh, attained back a uh, probability distribution, not a single uh, value uh, for the best fit. So this is, uh, from this, you can get a sense of the uh, variance along the chain. So in the lower left, we have um, the result from Theseus um, uh, nuts, so the, the, the nut sampler is associated with this uh, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And the spread of the, you can see that the green uh, C alpha trace is quite a bit thicker than the uh, ones at the top. And uh, this is because we actually have 100 uh, C alpha traces being represented. And so the thickness of the trace um, uh, is a reflection of the variance. And uh, the plot in the uh, uh, lower right shows uh, uh, that the use of the um, Theseus uh, nuts uh, approach uh, gives improved results for the center of the structure. So the uh, average of uh, these 100 uh, structures actually agrees very well with the result from uh, the uh, Theseus uh, map approach. So our tool chain, so we went about trying to apply this uh, probabilistic programming approach in Clojure. And this is a, a list of the uh, libraries that we used. Um, we could not do all of this in Clojure. We um, had to reach out to Python. And instead of using Pyro, we actually used uh, PyMC and PyTensor. So PyTensor is playing the role that Jax would play. And, um, this is a code snippet. Um, so this is code that uh, uh, um, actually Daniel Slutsky uh, developed. So um, uh, this shows a, um, uh, in this code we have the, a Python with statement. And uh, this Python with statement is used to uh, define in PyMC the uh, statistical model that we're using. So here are, um, we, um, because of that chain break, uh, because of the discrepancy in, uh, the, uh, um, between the two structures, we did our fitting just with the first uh, 100 residues. And this shows the two structures separated in space. Um, and, uh, and they're in uh, different orientations. Um, this uh, visualization was actually done in 3D JS. So we have our C alpha trace. Um, our reference structure is shown in uh, orange. 
And this is demonstrating how um, you need to vary the number of uh, nuts tuning steps uh, in order to reach convergence. So initially, our um, samples from our posterior distribution are uh, quite, uh, don't agree with the reference structure. Or, and, uh, but uh, over, uh, as the number of tuning steps increase, we get uh, very good agreement. So uh, these are our conclusions. Uh, we need a tensor library kind of like JAX uh, in the uh, closure environment to be able to implement uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, and it would be ideal to uh, uh, deploy the iterative uh, NUTS algorithm, which is a new development. The prior uh, NUTS uh, algorithm is called the recursive NUTS. And uh, the iterative NUTS is uh, used by Pyro and it's supposed to be uh, much more efficient. Um, so lib Python CLJ was uh, essential for uh, uh, Python interoperability. And uh, we have shown that uh, PyMC and PyTensor can provide an alternate route to uh, uh, doing these superpositions. So our future directions would be to uh, uh, modify the code to be able to handle structures that uh, differ in the number of residues. And, um, and then it's also, pot I just showed uh, examples where two structures are superimposed, but there are situations where you may want to superimpose 20 structures at once. And uh, um, then uh, we like to compare the two different uh, NUTS algorithms, and we would try, like to try implementing this with other probabilistic programming languages. And, uh, and then you know, the future would be uh, maybe try a deep learning approach to this problem. So I'd like to thank Daniel for his uh, developing the closure code and uh, for uh, drawing me into the closure uh, world. And I'd like to thank the joint uh, uh, PROB community. Uh, I think we spent about 30 hours together on Saturdays um, discussing various aspects of Bayesian data analysis. And, uh, and then uh, these are the sources of my uh, funding for my research. Be happy to take any questions.